Okay, thank you for introduction. So I will start by stating the obvious. Um, yes, deep, ne deep, learning, uh, deep networks work really well, and uh, to get best results from them, one needs lots of annotated data. It was not until the creation of uh, big annotated image net that uh, the current deep learning craze has started. Uh, there are some domains like images of cats and dogs where mining lots of annotated data from internet is easy. There are, however, many other domains where it's not. Uh, this include biomedical images, um, some modalities, some image types where annotation is challenging for humans, especially uh, for non-experts. There are also uh, many tasks requiring pixel-level annotations, and such annotations can be really tedious. So in such situations, there are often some sources of surrogate data. And uh, 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 the exploring those sources becomes uh, uh, more and more popular in the community. Uh, for example, one can borrow from adjacent modality, uh, having similar but different images which are annotated. One can uh, generate uh, images using computer graphics. Um, and uh, finally, uh, in many cases, um, there are ways to augment your data that you already have by uh, adding some artificial transformations. And uh, um, this would give you a big annotated data set, but unfortunately, uh, in many real life situations, the resulting training data is shifted um, in, uh, in a certain sense, and uh, deep networks trained on such shifted data may overfit to the differences between the training data and the data, the data you actually care about leading to a quite significant drop in performance. Okay. Um, um, just to give, uh, before I proceed, just to give you some concrete examples. Um, this is an illustration from the most popular uh, benchmark of, of such multiple domain uh, training, the office data set. And uh, uh, this particular pair of domains of image types shows uh, the realistic scenario when you train on internet originated images and you want to deploy, uh, deploy your image classifier um, uh, say on your robot which is equipped with something like a webcam. And you see that uh, the images look really differently uh, even though they depict same classes of objects. Uh, another popular uh, scenario you train on synthetic data like on the left or you train on semi-synthetic data, and I call it semi-synthetic uh, because it uses real backgrounds uh, and real images superimposed on top, but the imposition process is, 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 is artificial. And then you want, of course, your trained network to perform well on uh, real data. And this uh, synthetically generated uh, 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 data training become, is becoming really more and more popular. Here are some illustrations from two uh, very recent work. And you see images which look really realistic. And they're meticulously annotated. You get this, those pixel level annotations, which would be really hard to get uh, uh, with the human labeling. Um, but unfortunately, while those images look, do look realistic to us, the results of network train just on them are actually quite uh, poor, so to get the really good results, quite a large amount of labeled real data have to be admixed into the training process. Um, so today I will, uh, I will consider the following, uh, the following um, uh, scenario. Let's assume that uh, you have lots of labeled data in the source domain, like synthetic images. Let's assume that you have lots of unlabeled data in the target domain. Uh, for example, real images, and your goal is to train a deep network which uh, does well on the target domain. Such scenario is uh, called uh, unsupervised domain adaptation. There could be uh, cases, and maybe in most uh, scenarios, there would be a case for semi-supervised domain annotation when you have some small amount of labeled data in the target domain, but the ideas I will be talking about today generalize to those scenarios pretty straightforwardly. Okay. Um, so the, uh, uh, so the problem that we will be dealing today is the difference in the two distributions. Um, to highlight uh, this difference, let me take my deep network, uh, uh, and let's assume it was trained on a source domain. Let me split it into two parts. The first part um, I will somewhat arbitrarily call feature extractor, uh, and uh, 
the second part I will call level predictor. In general, I will be talking about image classification for the most part of the talk, and then I will discuss other tasks. Um, and then if we look at the visualization uh, uh, of, uh, of the features extracted by the feature extractor, and if I look at uh, what are the features of the two domains, and I show them using TCNE encoding uh, on a plane, and uh, red would denote the target domain, and blue would denote the uh, source domain, uh, what we will see is that uh, the two distributions are really different. This is actually a real, real, real case example uh, for some real data sets. Um, the blue features are already nicely separated by the time we, to, uh, we get to this middle of the network, and those groups correspond to individual classes, while uh, the red distribution is quite complex and distinct from the blue one. Uh, okay, so what we uh, need is some mechanism that would uh, allow us to align the two distributions, right? We want to get to this situation where blue and red features are distributed approximately uh, similarly, and then uh, blue features are still good for classification. So we need some mechanism to perform alignment of distribution in uh, high dimensions. And uh, there are many ways, or several ways, how you can do it with deep learning. Generally, you take some loss, which measures the separation between distributions, and you plug it into the learning process so that during learning it affects, um, uh, it affects the feature structure. And possible choices are um, um, do it parametrically, like measure uh, first and second order moments, and uh, that would be your loss, and you want to minimize it, so you want to align your distributions up to those moments. Um, and th this has been tried uh, for domain adaptation in, in this work. Um, and some others. Uh, another popular idea is maximum mean discrepancy, uh, which has already been investigated and works well. Today, I will naturally be talking about uh, adversarial learning for distribution alignment. GANs can be used for, for distribution alignment, uh, as uh, has been already discussed, and that's how we'll use them here. Uh, uh, in the first part of the talk, so the results will be uh, from mostly the first two papers here, and many of them will be, were obtained by Yaroslav Ganin, who is uh, my PhD student. Um, okay, and uh, now we have a problem. Uh, yeah, uh, I haven't touched anything. I can try to replug. Uh, the projector is not working from what I can see here. Hello, uh, Houston. Can someone in the back? Any te help from technician? Thanks. So now, uh, since we want to do uh, adversarial learning, we will start by adding a, a binary classifier, the main classifier, which will uh, look at points in the feature space and try to predict, learn, uh, will be updated to predict which domain would they come from. And um, the, uh, in the situation when the, the two distributions are easily distinguishable, the domain classifier loss will be low. And when they're mixed, uh, it will be high. So we want our feature extractor to fool the domain classifier um, and to ensure that its loss is high. So uh, what we will do then, uh, we will build such tripartite network, um, and uh, we will train the feature extractor and class predictor on source data, because we need label 
labels for such training, and we only have it for source domain. And we will train uh, feature extraction and domain classifier on all data because we don't need the labels. We just need to know which domain uh, does each example come from. And at test time, we will just discard the domain classifier and use the feature extractor and class predictor to make predictions. Okay. Uh, here is how uh, gradients will flow in this uh, uh, during the learning process uh, using standard backpropagation. Uh, so the feature extractor will be updated by the losses both from uh, uh, class, uh, classif uh, class predictor and the main classifier. And if I just do this naively, I will get features which are good for predicting uh, class labels, but are also good to, for predicting, uh, for predicting uh, domain label. Yeah, that's, uh, I want the first one, but the opposite of the second one, because I want my features to be domain invariant in this uh, setting. So what I can do, the easiest thing I can do is I can reverse the gradient when it comes during backpropagation from the domain classifier into, uh, into the feature extractor by multiplying it by some small negative constant. And uh, then, if the learning process uh, is successful, I will, get, uh, features, uh, I will get features which are domain invariant, at least from the viewpoint of my domain classifier. Okay, that's uh, the idea how uh, we proceed. These are some formal equations for domain, uh, well, for, for uh, gradient descent. Of course, we can use like Adam version of that. Uh, one important idea is that you have to anneal those lambda, this lambda from zero to something uh, uh, constant uh, because during the early stages, having this adversarial term really confuses the training process. Um, okay. Um, um, now, um, um, if we analyze where does this process leads, um, uh, and then we can see that if it uh, converges, uh, then it converges to settled point of uh, zero sum game uh, with uh, this uh, policy uh, played with played by uh, um, uh, domain classifier on one hand and uh, feature extractor and label predictor on the other hand. Um, and um, uh, so this is a zero-sum game. We have also tried a non-zero-sum game uh, using label inversion. This is trick number two from uh, Sumith talk before, uh, before the lunch break. In our experiments, it did not improve the results, uh, but it may be still worth trying. Um, in parallel with us, uh, Berkeley uh, group investigated the same idea and uh, uh, they found out that in their experiments, especially in the early stages of training, um, the maximum confusion objective, which measures um, uh, used for the feature extractor uh, part, uh, worked better. And maximum confusion means that they measure uh, cross correlation with uh, uh, cross entropy with 50 50 distribution. They, uh, the feature extractor is updated so that the discriminator uh, thinks that it's has uh, equal chance of, be, of coming from source domain and target domain. Uh, okay. Uh, if you go for, for the simplest case, the zero sum game, then you can implement it using this uh, uh, gradient reversal layer, which is uh, easy in most uh, deep learning packages. And then you can uh, train uh, your discriminator, uh, your domain classifier and feature extractor at the same time, not, not in stages, which is, uh, can have slight benefits. Um, but of course, you can do it in stages like in normal game training. Uh, so does it work? Uh, well, in some situations, uh, this, uh, uh, this approach does work. This is one example. We train on here on synthetic uh, digits and uh, test on real digits. Uh, the no adapt column is uh, what happens when you train on synthetic data and just test it on real data without any changes. The upper bound, uh, which is perhaps not exactly correct, but anyway, upper bound here means uh, uh, a system which is trained on real data uh, and that has access to the labels in the real domain. And deep adapt is the approach that I have just discussed, which doesn't have access to such labels, but has access to unlabeled data in the target domain. And in this particular case, it, it, it bridges uh, this gap between no adapt and upper bound, uh, uh, you know, bridging majority of this gap. Uh, this situation, it's less successful, but still we see uh, uh, considerable improvement. Um, uh, interestingly, in, uh, when we look at the reverse direction, uh, 
it doesn't work. Well, it works, it works better than chance, but uh, it will get maybe to 30% or so, uh, which, is, uh, which, is, which is quite low. And I think the, the reverse direction is a good benchmark for methods. I think it's still uh, uh, very few methods managed to, to, to make it work as of now. Uh, we also tried it on the office data sets and got uh, results which were state of the art as of two years ago, but the, since then they were superseded by newer methods that I will discuss now. Okay, uh, so one potential source of improvement is uh, uh, not sharing all of the feature extractor between the two domains. So, so far in the approach that I discussed, same feature extractor was used for both domains and we discussed at some point in our group whether this is the right thing to do. I was insisting, yes, it was the right thing. Those feature extractors are very big. They have like tons of parameters, uh, so they should be able to learn uh, good feature matching, which is both uh, feature mapping, which is both invariant and extracts all necessary information, which is, uh, which requires, which is required for classification. Turns out I was uh, wrong, and you can do better by training uh, two separate uh, feature extractors for each of the domains, but you have to do it carefully. One example is this paper, which showed that by sharing uh, parameters in some layers, but uh, not, sh uh, not sharing in others, uh, you can get better results. But when you don't share, you have to have some regularizer which penalizes the difference in weights between the two domains. For example, it ensures that uh, the weights in one domain are close to some affine function, uh, well, constant time plus bias of uh, the weights uh, uh, in another domain. Uh, and then you have to use some uh, criterion to decide which uh, uh, layers to share and which layers not to share. And unfortunately, in the error experiments, there is no consistent strategy. You have really to decide it on case-by-case -case basis. So for some domain pairs, some layers have to be shared, but not for others. Uh, so this is a challenging uh, task uh, to accomplish. Uh, but if you do, they get a quite significant improvement in the results. Uh, domain separation networks presented by Google Group uh, last NIPS went further. Here they have a system which perform classification and reconstruction um, at the same time. And they train uh, uh, three different feature extractors. Uh, one which is shared between the domains and uh, uh, the other two uh, are uh, not shared. They are like domain specific. And the shared decoder has to be able to reconstruct the original input data. And then there is an adversarial term, just as in the previous approaches, which ensures that uh, the features extracted by shared uh, feature extractor have similar distributions across both domains. So that, that, that's uh, inherited from the previous approach. Uh, and then, of course, your classifier has to make classification based only on the shared features. And, it ha and uh, by construction, ignores uh, uh, domain-specific features. Um, and uh, the last bit which is required to make it work is uh, some regularizer which uh, enforces orthogonality between uh, shared features and domain-specific features. Um, and they have shown that with, these, um, uh, with this architecture, which combines this uh, autoencoding, uh, orthogonality, and adversarial learning, and classification, they can uh, get uh, quite significant improvement uh, on a range of uh, data sets. Um, okay, and uh, then uh, the last uh, approach I want to go in some detail uh, today is the recent work uh, from uh, Berkeley and Boston groups, uh, which is uh, another very nice uh, 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 twist of uh, the domain adapt uh, of adversarial domain adaptation. Here they do it in two stages, and they show that it works better than when you do it in one stage. And the first stage is um, uh, straightforward training of, uh, of uh, class predicting uh, uh, CNN on the source domain. So we just train a regular predicting ConvNet on source domain uh, node twists. Um, and uh, then in the second stage, you freeze what you have trained in the first stage. Um, so we get some fi fixed feature distribution uh, for source domain, and now you train a new uh, feature extractor, which is essentially a conditional generator uh, 
for the target domain, and the goal of training uh, is to learn a feature extractor which would match the distribution of uh, uh, the source domain features. Uh, so essentially, this part of the training, this stage, uh, corresponds to adversarial, um, to adversarial learning, uh, conditioned on the input images, where you match distribution in the, in, in the feature space. Uh, and then at test time, uh, at test time, um, you just use a new feature extractor and uh, a classifier from the first stage. Um, and uh, uh, this, uh, I think, this breaking into the, to the two parts makes uh, makes it easier to train, uh, especially if you're familiar with generative uh, generative GANs. Then you can use your sort of experience in training this over the second stage of the approach. Okay. Uh, so I've, I've been talking uh, almost exclusively about classification, uh, and I probably won't have uh, time to go into detail on other tasks, but I just want to mention that uh, you can use uh, very similar ideas for other computer vision tasks, for example, in uh, re-identification, where um, domain shifts are, are a big problem. All, all those data sets, they have different looking images. And, uh, um, uh, limited amount of annotated data, so the annotated data is precious. Uh, and then if you combine metric learning in, uh, with uh, uh, domain uh, adversarial uh, term, just as in the classification case, you do get uh, at least small improvement uh, in um, uh, identification accuracy. Uh, there are also other works that show that for semantic segmentation. Uh, and finally, before, con before I come to conclusions, let me mention that there is like another string of work which is not covered in this talk, but which is becoming increasingly popular when you use adversarial tr uh, training to do domain adaptation, but you don't adapt at feature level somewhere deep by matching distributions somewhere deep uh, in your network. Um, and instead, you, um, uh, you use GANs, you use generative GANs to translate uh, to uh, modify, say, your synthetic images to make them look more like real, to add some artifacts uh, typical for real images. Um, and uh, they show uh, both of these works, let's say, from last CV pair, but there are more examples show that there is a, that this works, uh, although mostly they show that this works for quite closed domains. Okay? Uh, I cannot say anything conclusive, uh, but the intuition is that for large domain gains, it makes more sense to adapt in, in feature space, but of course intuition, intuition uh, can, be, can be deceiving. Uh, okay, so to conclude, uh, um, unsupervised domain adaptation can be handled using adversarial learning. Uh, extending to semi-supervised case is uh, straightforward. Um, this process it borrows ideas from generative GANs, but it is in some sense easier because you always have some external loss and other loss which sort of stabilizes the training, at least to some extent. Uh, what's challenging though, uh, uh, well, another benefit compared to generative GANs is uh, that you have uh, real numbers how to judge, judge your success, um, uh, which are numbers how do, well, does your system perform on, on uh, target domain. Uh, when you do unsupervised domain adaptation, there is like a big caveat though. Currently, working with GANs requires lots of parameter tuning, and uh, when you do unsupervised domain adaptation, once you, for the first time, look at your performance of your system on the test set, then parameter tuning essentially becomes cheating, and you have to walk this uh, fine line. So uh, this is, I would say, the main challenge here. And another uh, thing that I wanted to mention in the end is that I've shown you some examples and excerpts from some papers which report really good results, uh, but it's definitely not a solved problem in, for some domain pairs and some tasks, especially for semantic segmentation, I would say. Uh, the results for unsupervised domain adaptations are actually quite poor, and there are lots of gains to be made. Uh, uh, so uh, there should be definitely new development in this story. Okay, uh, thank you for your attention, and I think we have time for some questions. Um, uh, 
Hi. Th over here. Okay. Uh, thanks for the great talk. I had a question. How do you deal if the source domain and the synthetic domain have a different dis distribution of labels? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, this is a great question. Uh, the artificial, um, the artificial, well, the benchmarks uh, have this balancing sort of thing built in them. That's why it works. When we work uh, with uh, like more realistic data, uh, we kind of hope that the distributions are not aligned perfectly in some sense. Uh, and they're not aligned perfectly in the end, and that's why there are some gains which we see from, 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 from this adversarial domain ad adaptation. Um, so if your labels are imbalanced, then this whole idea that you want to align distributions becomes flawed. Uh, and uh, I don't know any easy answer to this problem. Um, um, and I think this is part of the reason why, say, for semantic segmentation, uh, training on greatly looking synthetic images leads to uh, not so great performance. Thank you very much.